Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jen Kelly, a librarian here at the College of DuPage, and today we are talking about preventing, identifying, and dealing with plagiarism, the second in our um, series on academic integrity uh, webinars this semester. So we'll be talking about four primary things, um, the definition of plagiarism, preventing plagiarism, identifying plagiarism, and dealing with it, as the title says, right? <laughs> uh, let's get started. Let me see, I'm looking at my slides here. Here we go. Let's start with a definition of plagiarism. Um, how would you define plagiarism? What are words, phrases that come to mind? Go ahead and um, type those in the chat box, or if you want to be fancy, um, you can. Let me show you here. Uh, go up to, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, it kind of limits <laughs> the upper left-hand corner of your screen, and you can grab the little text box, and or you can write on the screen if you'd like. But go ahead and share the definition of plagiarism. So we've got the unattributed use of someone else's words or ideas. Okay. Anyone else? Using work that isn't your own without permission. Using someone else's work as your own. Okay, great. We have a consensus, it looks like. Um, Let's see. So there are different definitions of plagiarism and credit for another's work. Great. Um, different definitions of plagiarism. And the one that I like a lot is this one from uh, the WPA statement on um, best practices for defining and avoiding plagiarism. So in their statement, they say that Plagiarism in an instructional set setting occurs when a writer deliberately uses someone else's language, ideas, or other original, not common knowledge material without acknowledging its source. And what I think is important about this definition, opposed to other definitions, is the idea of deliberate, the deliberate use of someone else's language, ideas, um, or other material. So intent is important when we look at plagiarism in an instructional setting. Um, it's a serious academic infringement. Um, it's cheating. But knowing and recognizing when it's done deliberately is an important distinction in educational setting when we also have novice students who might be misusing sources um, as part of the learning process, right? So our students are novice writers. That is an expected part of the learning experience to make mistakes, right? So defining plagiarism as as theft that's intentional and deliberate, I think is an important um, distinction when we talk about plagiarism. So plagiarism in this context isn't necessarily not forgetting to cite your sources or citing your sources badly. It's not um, using materials because you are unaware of the conventions. It is making an active decision to say, I am going to cheat, I'm going to plagiarize. So with that definition in mind, what potential issues does this raise for the classroom? What are your thoughts on this distinction between plagiarism and misusing sources? Any initial impressions? Yeah, a lot of it is about educating the students. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let's look at some discussions about what is plagiarism here. So in this sort of complicated looking flow chart, which is adapted from something that's a little less complicated looking, um, simple questions is some of the language copied from another source, is the language attributed to the original source, is the string of is a string of unattributed language more than seven or ten words in one sentence? Going through a yes, no, um, but recognizing that it could be plagiarism in certain cases. Um, some places where it might seem like it could be not plagiarism. And this idea of um, patch writing, which we'll talk about, characteristic of learners not yet adept at paraphrasing and should not be considered plagiarism. And then another concept of self-plagiarism, which I think Bob brought up earlier in this idea of, of students recycling papers, right? Um, and this is an education point for our students. When I've interviewed the ALP English students about their perceptions of cheating, uh, most of them are unaware that they can't do this, that they can't take a paper that they wrote for another class and use it for a separate class, right? Um, they don't think of it as plagiarism because they wrote it, they haven't cheated. So that's another point for discussion with your students. So any questions, comments on this part? We will move along. So now we have a definition of plagiarism, right? We have this idea that um, it is, it's a deliberate decision that a student makes to cheat as opposed to a student making mistakes as they learn how to become better writers, right? So we'll talk about how we can prevent um, both misusing of sources and the tendency or the desire or the inclination to, to cheat and to plagiarize. Uh, let's see, so students, so why do they plagiarize? Again, there's there's no excuse for plagiarism, of course, um, but understanding why they do it can help us prevent it in the first place. So fear of failure, poor time management skills, right? So it's hadn't thought about their schedule and here's the papers due and so they buy a paper or copy a paper. Um, a lack of interest. They don't care. They're not interested. They're not willing to put in the time and effort. Um, cynicism related to that lack of interest. Um, and also this idea that, that cheating isn't taken seriously. If they feel like the instructor is checked out, if they feel that the instructor has let other people get away with it, or if the institution has a history of letting students get away with it and it not being um, applied equally across the board, then it's a lot of fair attitude towards that. So now knowing this, what can you do? Um, the fear of failure, give students opportunities to try and fail with, with little or no consequence have ungraded assignments, give them practice writing, um, let them know that the stakes don't have to be high. Uh, if it's ungraded, then the pressure is off and that need to cheat um, can, be, can be lessened as well. Work with the library and learning commons um, to you know, give your students some additional support. Um, the workshops that the Learning Commons has, the tutorials and all the other materials can help take some of the anxiety out of writing assignments away from students. Um, scaffolding assignments can help with some poor time management skills that students have. Again, sometimes students procrastinate and there's, there's only so much you can do, right? Um, a lack of interest, so creating authentic assignments interdisciplinary assignments, making the writing prompts or assignments interesting to students' other studies. So if they are in a required course, but their area of study is something else, um, 
maybe allow the, the student to do some writing around their own interests, around their own, around other classes that they're taking. Um, perception that cheating is easy and is not taken seriously, discuss those, the, the policy, discuss the penalty. Um, it, make it clear to your students early on that you take this seriously, that the institution takes it seriously, and that if they cheat, if they plagiarize, this is what will happen. Um, let's see, so Bob's saying that ungraded assignments tell them that's not important. And I think that it can be the case, but then I think it's it's how do you let a student know that that this assignment has value beyond a grade, right? So some students are only doing it for the grade, sure, but um, how do we how do we communicate this process? How do we take both the anxiety of it away and also make it clear that that this is a valuable skill? I think that's a really hard question to answer. And it's maybe a little bit of a trade-off, but we see that there's this, you know, they won't do it unless there's a grade, but the grade makes them anxious about failing and about expertise and all these other things. And so, you know, what's the middle ground there? I don't know. I don't necessarily have the answer for that. Something else to consider from your student's perspective when, with plagiarizing is whether or not they have the, the knowledge, skills, and ability to actually complete your assignments, right? I think there are uh, different expectations across campus and across disciplines. Um, I remember talking about um, plagiarism on a panel that the Phi Theta Kappa students put together and um, an instructor from the social sciences being really surprised that the research process wasn't taught in English 1101. So there was this assumption that students, if they've taken English 1101, have, have done college research. Um, I think there's also sometimes an assumption that students are learning all of this in high school. And some are and some aren't. Um, so the key skills that students need to write an academic paper uh, might still be developing in them um, that might not have experience. They might be out of practice if they're returning students. So um, do your students know how to take proper notes? Do they know how to integrate other people's ideas into their own? Um, summarizing and paraphrasing are, are um, two skills that are really important. Summarizing a little bit easier, paraphrasing really, really challenging. Um, documentation skills and attribution skills. And again, the library and the writing commons are good places where um, students who don't have these skills can get some assistance with them. Um, Julia is saying, we have clinical assignments with charting that needs to be at a satisfactory level if students are, and if not, students are given opportunities to make revisions. Absolutely. And I think in order to encourage students to grow, um, it's, they're more likely to do that and to try if they know that they can, they can keep trying, right? Instead of it's an all or nothing. Again, that takes the pressure off. Um, Let's see. Okay, so that's the student side of things, the things that we can do to, to help students who might be cheating for reasons that we can solve. Of course, there's students are going to cheat and, you know, giving them scaffolded assignments and, and giving them opportunities to work with a librarian. Those, those might not help, right? But for the ones that we can help, those are the options. Um, so your assignments are another piece of this puzzle. So what can you do with your assignments to make it more challenging for the determined cheater <laughs> to, um, to not be able to plagiarize? So I believe, and I'm missing my attribution and I feel bad about this, um, I believe it's James Lang in, um, in his book on cheating, where he talks about 
contextualizing writing prompts to um, make them less generic and to make them require students to maybe think outside of the box or prevent them essentially from buying a paper or copying things off the internet. So the four ways that you can, four of the ways that you can contextualize writing prompts are by time. So um, your students are connecting to course content, to events, conversations, trends, research, things that are happening now, All right. So um, if it just happened yesterday, there's not a paper that they can steal, right? So having them write about, you know, let's talk about the Supreme Court decisions that came um, came down yesterday, or let's talk about something that was in the news or something that I just saw on television. Um, place, so connecting something to the local community. I've seen lots and lots of assignments that are based on um, things that are happening in DuPage County, things that are happening in student-owned um, hometowns and communities. Um, focusing a, an assignment around things happening here at the College of DuPage. Um, interviews, excellent. That's, a, that's another good suggestion, Tom. Thank you. Um, and that's and that goes on to my next thing, which is personal. So that little icon is supposed to be a selfie, I guess. Um, and students connecting course content to a specific experience in their lives. So I think a lot of journaling and reflective writing does this, um, and we can we can draw that out as well. And then there's interdisciplinary um, contexts. So students can draw connections between your course, other courses, and maybe co-curricular activities, right? So it's sort of um, pulling together all of those ideas, time, place, pers and personal as well. So the more we can ground our writing assignments in, in these contexts, um, still giving students freedom to explore ideas that are interesting to them or ideas that are meaningful to them, but not opening it up to write about anything in the world, um, thereby giving students the opportunity to, to purchase a generic paper, right? Current events, absolutely. That's a, a very, very good way to, um, to limit plagiarism. But again, knowing that there's lots of people writing about something like the 2018 election. So there's opinions and, and things because it's something that we're anticipating. Whereas something that is more time specific, like something that just happened, there would be less opportunity. But it's hard to say. I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do, right? <laughs> So knowing what we know about the skills students should have to be academic writers, um, their abilities, their, their knowledge, their behaviors, and knowing your own assignments and what you've done um, to create them, are those things aligned? Are you asking students to do things that they are prepared to do? Um, do they have those skills? Are they aware of the conventions? Um, do you know if your students have written research papers before? Do you know that they are aware of, of uh, academic integrity conventions? You know, are the students from other countries have different understandings of how to cite things, how to incorporate other people's ideas? So these are things to think about um, when you're crafting or revising an assignment and when you're getting to know your students, right? Thinking about how those two things um, work together. That's another great idea, the career um, connection, because it is something that students are thinking about, so it's interesting for them. Um, they're learning something that will be helpful to them, and they are, are writing on a subject that it would be more challenging to, to plagiarize from. So some best practices for the classroom. Um, discuss plagiarism with your students, right? Um, that should be one of the first things you do on the first day of classes when you're talking about your syllabus and everything else. Um, explain the, um, 
the consequences and the policies and the procedures. Um, establish consequences, right? Let them know what will happen. Encourage academic integrity. Uh, the campaign for this will be, be happening um, in the fall, so there'll be lots of opportunities, and you can also use the library's research guide on academic integrity um, to give you some ideas of how to, to create this um, idea of, of academic integrity in your classroom. Um, and then model proper citation strategies in your own writing, in your syllabus. Do you cite your sources? <laughs> Do you um, attribute images when you create a PowerPoint slide? Um, show students that it's it's something that's done, that it's not just a thing that happens in um, academic writing that they're, they're forced to do. Um, even if it's just, you know, like I have here, just a little URL at the bottom so that I know where I got my information from and then you do as well. Identifying plagiarism. Um, what does plagiarism look like? Right. And what does novice writing look like? I'm sure you have bazillions of examples, <laughs> having seen the, you know, the entire spectrum of novice writing through um, all of the possible ways that a student can plagiarize. Um, but let's take a look at a couple of things here. Um, plagiarism, very straightforward. Uh, we have a big old section of con of content from an original source popped into student writing, right? It's clear this is the kind of thing that would show up um, in something like Safe Assign. Um, and it's the kind of thing that you would, as a reader of student writing, would recognize as this does not seem like the student's voice here. More challenging is identifying patch writing. So uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with the phrase patch writing. Again, that's that little outline of a person down at the bottom of your screen. Oh, someone's microphone is on. Oh, it's me. Sorry. <laughs> Here's some banging and there you go. Oh, there you go, Bob. You got everything working. Um, so is anyone familiar with the concept of patch writing? Oh, Andrea is excellent. Great. Well, patch writing is um, called this for a reason. So here we have an original quote. Here we have a patch written quote, um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, oh, it did not happen. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, it's supposed to be all kinds of pretty colors that show you. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this here. Um, yeah, let me underline here. So you'll see that. Let's see that there's they're taking words like um, let's see cancer activities of cannabis, changing that to anti-cancer properties of cannabinoids um, instead of a growing body of preclinical data. It's an increasing amount. Patch writing is a combination of two things. One from the novice student perspective is really just bad paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is really challenging and I think students don't understand A, how to do it or B, why they should be doing it. Um, when I meet with students and talk to them in the um, ALP English classes, I generally say, um, if you read something, put it away entirely and then can rephrase that in your own words, then you're paraphrasing, like without looking at the source at all. You've, you've read it, you understand it well enough that you could explain it to someone else without looking at the original. Then you, you're, you're probably paraphrasing fairly well. If you have to keep going back to the source and then occasionally open up thesaurus.com in order to find a synonym, um, you should probably just quote the whole thing. Um, and that's something that we can ask our our novice students to do, right? So don't, if you are patch writing something like this, chances are it's because the original source is too complicated, it's too technical. And we see this a lot when we're asking students to read academic journals, um, when we're asking them to look at original resource research, uh, for most of the things we're having our students do in um, 
are 1100 level courses, they don't necessarily need to be reading really dense scientific in literature. That's when students are going to fail at paraphrasing. They're going to fail at summarizing because they have not succeeded in actually understanding the content. Um, and yes, Bob, I can, I can um, share some information on patch writing and I'll put that up on the library's guide, which is org academic honesty so codlrc.org academic honesty and i will put that in the instructor toolbox okay so next up so we're talking about the difference between plagiarism and the misuse of sources right so plagiarism submitting someone else's text as your own that was one of the definitions you guys came up with at the beginning attempting to blur the line between your own ideas and somebody else's ideas um, so these two things are are um, intentional right so a student is actively making this decision to to do this this is shoplifting right as opposed to walking out of the store with a basket full of groceries because your phone rang and you're distracted you know you're not trying to steal you're just not very good at multitasking right and that's misusing sources so doing it carelessly doing it inadequately um, not knowing what it is that you're doing um, because you've never learned it because you are um, doing it badly you know so there's not that I'm trying to get away with something. I'm hoping I don't get caught. This instead is I'm doing the best I can because I'm new to this. I'm figuring it out. I'm learning. So the reasons why students do that, they don't know how to integrate their ideas. Um, they're not good at taking notes. So they're using all of these sources and they've forgotten where things came from. Um, they don't have these techniques that we probably all learned when, you know, all, all of our big piles of index cards, right? Um, and having a strategy for keeping track of those. Um, inconsistent definitions of plagiarism. Plagiarism isn't the same um, in every discipline. You know, there's, there's disciplines where copying something is essential. You know, think about uh, paralegals using forms. You know, you do not want to be improvising those things. You don't want to paraphrase those. You don't want to be creating your own. So there's there's certain disciplines where um, originality isn't the goal. Um, An unfamiliarity with academic writing conventions. So academic writing versus other types of writing. Um, cultural differences in attribution and plagiarism conventions, which we mentioned, and then contextual inconsistencies. Um, and the, again, this is comes coming from that WPA statement and best practices for plagiarism, which is another excellent resource I will put on the, the guide. Um, other reasons why students might misuse sources, um, this idea of cryptomnesia. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with this term. I learned it a little a while ago. Let me type it in here. Um, I think it's fascinating. And we all do this. This is something you're reading something so intently or you're so involved in something that you forget what your own What's your own ideas versus what someone else's ideas like you've you've assimilated it into yourself. Um, to the point where you don't remember where it came from. And so maybe you assume it's your own. Um, another influence on students misusing sources is just the impact of cognitive load. You know, how much are they doing? How much are they trying to do? Is it just write a few sentence on, sentences on something? Or is it you also need to make sure that your font is 12 points, your margins are one inch, it's an APA format, um, it's printed out double-sided, you know, all these things that we pile up on top of students in assignments um, increase the likelihood that they won't put as much attention into all of them and um, the cognitive load becomes too heavy and something needs to go, right? So sometimes it's easier to focus on, you know, your font than it is on something more challenging and maybe more wobbly like 
citing your sources correctly or paraphrasing correctly. Uh, so best practices for working with these novice writers, and I'm sure you all have your own um, recommendations and suggestions and, and tools that you use, um, but make sure your students know the writing conventions of your discipline. Um, there's English writing, there's social science writing, there's science writing, there's humanities writing. Um, they all have different expectations, and it's not just about citing. Um, it's not just about the APA versus MLA. Um, there's a lot more to it. So making it clear what you expect from your students and why you expect it. Um, and determining whether or not those expectations are reasonable. If you're teaching um, a science course where your students are not like the goal of the course isn't for students to do original research and have that research published. Maybe having the paper formatted with a running head and title page according to APA standards isn't, maybe that's not necessary. Maybe it's fine for your, to just ask your students to consider ideas um, and not focus so much on the format. Um, design writing assignments that reduce cognitive load. Um, provide students with resources for learning how to take careful notes. You know, just letting them know that there's a note-taking workshop for, um, offered by the Learning Commons, or, you know, get a sense of your classroom early on, like how many of you are super confident in note-taking? How many of you feel like that's a real challenge? And then providing them a place to go and learn about it. Um, clearly explain what plagiarism looks like to you in your classroom. Um, that might be different than what they've heard in other classes. But um, again, on the first day, I think this is one of the most important things you can do um, around cheating and plagiarism is, is let your students know your expectations around this, how you feel about it, um, and what will happen if they cheat or plagiarize. Um, and then just accept that errors are a part of learning. I was reading an article today in the Inside Higher Ed uh, about an instructor who's who doesn't go actively looking for students plagiarizing who, um, you know, finds it, takes it seriously, but doesn't freak out about it. And, and it, it was a very refreshing perspective. And I think that's, it's probably a challenge to, to say like, ah, students are going to make mistakes and occasionally they'll cheat. And if I don't catch it, then whatever, you know, so, that's a, I think accepting errors, it's probably different than accepting that students are going to cheat, but, you know, wherever you fall on that spectrum of, of the, of singing the theme song from Frozen, <laughs> we're good. Um, this student's opportunities to practice citation and the performance of honesty are closed down when their improper citation is read as a sign of dishonesty, rather than as a sign of authentic, of an authentic beginner engaged in the work of acquiring a new discourse. Um, for me, this is everything about citing sources. Um, I think no, knowing to attribute a source is more important than citing it in a publishable MLA or APA citation. Um, students um, are anxious about doing this and it gets in the way of of their writing and possibly enjoying their writing um, or understanding the purpose of their writing so um, maybe you ask yourself is it is it an outcome of this assignment that students will be able to create a bibliography that could be published in the journal of your discipline or is the purpose of the assignment that students will um, read other people's works and use what they read to inform their own um, opinions or writing or, or knowledge um, and be able to attribute that. So again, it's, it's thinking about your assignment, your students' abilities, and what it is you actually want students to be able to do. Uh, so the last couple of things I want to talk about is dealing with plagiarism. So kind of 
coming full circle here. Um, this is the shortest part of what I've got. Um, there's the academic integrity reporting form. And you can now find this link, this little image here of uh, Chappie here. It says report academic dishonesty. You can find that on Blackboard on the main dashboard of Blackboard. And you can also find it on the main dashboard of Inside COD, the portal. Um, and clicking that little square brings you to the newly revised academic integrity reporting form. And in order to fill this form out, um, just a few things that you need to gather in advance, and that's your evidence. Um, context, what happened, who was involved, um, what what evidence you're providing. Um, if there's any hard copies that you want to attach, you can do that as well. Um, notify the student and discuss the incident. That is part of the form. Recording the student's response. Um, do they accept responsibility? Um, are they accepting the resolution that you've proposed? Um, and then report the incident using the form. Uh, so everyone hopefully got the email from from Bob, who's here, who can talk about this if he'd like. Um, that was sent on the 19th, asking all the faculty to um, use the form and report any and all acts of academic dishonesty that you encounter. Um, so we are, in a way, trying to, to break the process to see what kind of um, discrepancies might happen, if there's any issues before it becomes a, you know, a more integrated process, but um, we're asking everybody to use it and to get used to using it. And um, and Bob identifies three reasons um, to use the form and report cheating, even if you do just resolve it, you know, with a student um, on your own. Um, we're tracking these incidents so that we can keep track of repeat offenders. Um, we are tracking how widespread the issue of cheating is. Um, and we are trying to create a culture of academic integrity so students don't cheat. So the more we talk about it with our students, the more we let them know that if we catch you cheating or plagiarizing, this is going to be reported. This is going into a database. And, um, you know, maybe it doesn't show up on a final transcript, but the students should know that we as a college, as an institution, and as a community take academic integrity seriously. And, and we're looking at it. We're thinking about it. And hopefully that will help dissuade students um, and and show them that that it's something that is valued at the college. Bob, do you have anything that you'd like to add? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, uh, two 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 short things. Um, in addition to students knowing that they're being tracked, um, there's also the distinct possibility of institutional sanctions that go beyond the individual sanctions that a professor might uh, give a student. Um, we, we really, really want to crack down and um, get students to not cheat multiple times and with, with multiple uh, instructors. Um, and so telling students that they're being tracked and that if they do it again, there's the possibility of being uh, kicked out of school for a period of time. Um, I, we think is uh, really important. And I forgot what the first thing I was going to say was. Um, but just pl please use the form. Um, oh, we, we also need, we're, we, one of the reasons why we're uh, tracking cheating is we need to know how big of an office of academic integrity we need. And that involves funding. You know, do we just, do we need an academic integrity officer? Do we need an event? an academic integrity officer with several um, administrative assistants or student, uh, you know, student employees. Uh, and that's, we'll, we'll find out next year just how much cheating is going on and how large a, an office we need. Ideally, what we're hoping is that students will, will stop cheating. <laughs> 
once once they once what going back to what you said very early on in this, uh, John, um, if students know that the institution takes this seriously, um, they're less likely to cheat. Now I'm done. Thanks, Bob. Um, and let's see. I am almost done now. So um, let you all know that there are uh, whoop, two more sessions he coming up. Not this one. This is not up upcoming because we're having it now. Um, but plagiarism resistant assignment. So we'll be talking about that a little bit more. Um, and then creating a classroom of culture, a classroom culture of integrity. So really taking all of what we talked about today and and coming up with you know an action plan for your classroom um, to to move this forward to to have it seem like it's something that we have always done and always um, embraced and making it very plain and and obvious to our students so that like Bob said it's something that the students it doesn't even occur to them right which is the goal um, so the guide that I mentioned uh, here's the URL I think I I typed that in as well. Um, oops, did not mean to just cross that out. There we go. Um, you'll find the instructor toolbox resources, the study that we've been doing on student perceptions of academic honesty. Um, great stuff in there. That is where this recording will end up, as well as some of the resources I promise to include on patch writing and a, and a couple of other things. Um, and if there are additional resources that you would like to see added to the toolbox, please let me know. Um, if there are other topics you would like to see discussed in a webinar or in some other setting, let me know. Um, and if, right now, if you have any questions, please feel free to either use your microphone and, and speak or use the chat box. Um, and I will take any of those questions. Um, Andrea has a comment. I think that may, what may impede reporting is that faculty feel bad and don't want students to get in trouble. Um, that That is an issue. That's something to think about. And I think part of our campaign in um, making the form second nature and making it and having it be adopted, I think is going to be hopefully empowering faculty in, to to know that they can they can handle this on their own, but they can also um, contribute to to this college wide culture in a way that isn't necessarily going to have implications for the student, but has a, a larger picture. Does that make sense? Um, and just I guess making it clear that that faculty can can report that you know I met with a student, we sorted it out on our own, and that's it. You know, and then you know nothing will happen. There's there's no repercussions, and I think that's sort of you know the best case scenario. Um, any additional questions? I got a question. Yeah. Um, how do we find this? You you. It's great you got the link here, but is there another way to to is there a a, a way to find that on the library web page itself? And I realize that's a stupid question, but um, no, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Apart from, let's see, searching for it. Uh, let me see if it is linked. You know, it's a good question. I don't think it's linked under the faculty page. I have. Um, So if you go to the library's website and click on faculty and staff, there is a link for plagiarism detection and prevention. And I will make sure that um, this also links to the academic integrity content. Great. So thank you. Great. And and on the act the plagiarism page, I will share that with everyone as well. Um, this has a link to the WPA statement on best practices um, and also a link to the how to avoid plagiarism tutorial that we created for students. Uh, we will be revising that um, in the upcoming year to make it a little bit more um, 
user friendly and make it so that faculty can assign it and get the results of their students um, pre-test and post-test. Right now you can't really do that, so we're, we'll be working on that and making it better. But right now it's a pretty good tutorial for students who um, might need some additional information about plagiarism. So um, there's that resource for you as well. Anything else? I want to thank you all for, for attending. I know some of you are, are off campus and uh, spending an hour in front of a computer listening to me talk about plagiarism instead of being outdoors, enjoying you know the last day before it gets crazy hot. <laughs> so everyone go outside and enjoy the last day before it gets crazy hot. And um, thank you again for, for joining me today and for participating. You are all very welcome. Yes, um, all four of the webinars are completely independent. Um, there's even a little bit of overlap in the content. So yes, if anybody like says like, oh, I missed it, um, they can absolutely join us um, on July 12th for plagiarism resistant assignments. And Bob, thank you very much for promoting this session too, like letting people know that you were, that you had signed up and that they should too. My pleasure. This was great. Uh, I'm going to be pushing people to take the next ones too. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm going to sign out. See ya. Bye.